getting Northern Ireland's centenary year off to a rousing start. With parades impossible, Londonderry unionists celebrated with a socially distanced performance. The negatives and the bad news always seem to lead the way, but there has been amazing people from here and amazing things that have happened, so we want to tell a positive story. Still Billy Hamilton, he's gone past Tendilio. And The government is keen we take this opportunity to salute our homegrown heroes. The winner, Wayne McCullough. Sports and you know, musicians, everything, it should be a big part of it because they bring people together. Back in 1971, the old Stormont government hosted a big 50th birthday bash. Remember the jingle on TV, which was Ulster 71, come and join in the fun. I think we were just looking at a chance to celebrate something that was joyous rather than the gloom and doom and everything that was building up. Unionists want to revive that spirit as they mark this year's centenary. There have been many of people throughout the years who have said that Northern Ireland wouldn't last, but I think the strength of its people have uh, pushed that away. But the enthusiasm for celebrating Northern Ireland's biggest birthday isn't shared by everyone. This has been an entity that has been established that has actually inbuilt discrimination, an inbuilt unionist majority, uh, systematic discrimination against the Catholic and nationalist populations. I don't think it's realistic for anyone to expect that nationalists or republicans would celebrate the centenary of the creation of the state. I think what we're looking at here really is a policing solution on the Ormer Road. I'm Mark Devonport and I've had a ringside seat reporting on our story for 35 years. Yes. 71.12%. I feel the hand of history upon our shoulder. As Northern Ireland reaches its centenary, I've been peering into the future and delving back into the past, meeting people who've learned shocking truths about their family history. When you were growing up, was this something that was talked about in the family? No. Never, ever was mentioned. I've been tracing how violence has ricocheted down through generations. This gunman come in, he opened fire through the door, hit the shoulder, down through the ribs, hit the spine. No British Conservative government could or should sign up to any such arrangement. I challenge the man under fire over the new Irish Sea border. What would you say to those unionists who've accused you of betrayal over this? What we're doing is removing the unnecessary protuberances and, and we're getting the, getting the barnacles off the thing. Are this month's riots a sign of what's to come? I'll be revealing a major opinion poll from both sides of the border, finding out if you think we could return to a cycle of violence and how long you predict Northern Ireland will last. It was always inevitable this year's centenary would be contested. That's not just because of the unresolved argument over our national identity. It's also down to the fact that Northern Ireland's birth took place amidst an eruption of sectarian violence, a wave of bloodshed more intense than anything I witnessed during my years reporting on the Troubles in the 1980s and 1990s. The level of violence between the summer of 1920 and the summer of 1922 in the new Northern Ireland is staggering. 557 people were killed. Just over 300 of them were Catholic. In the region of 180 were Protestants. The remainder were police or armed forces. For such a small geographic compact area, that's a very intense level of violence.
In June 1921, King George V traveled to Belfast, despite the misgivings of some of his advisers. Opening the new Northern Parliament at the City Hall, he urged the people of Ireland north and south to forgive and forget. However, his security chiefs were on the alert in case of an IRA assassination attempt. There were a lot of London detectives brought over. A lot of the people you see lining the streets are actually detectives brought in from London. The IRA decided that the security was, was, was too strong to act on the day. The monarch made it back to England unscathed. But his cavalry escort wasn't so lucky. They were ambushed as they crossed the new border on their way home. The day after the king's visit, as the king's honor guard passed by train through the South Armagh countryside, a number of troops and a large number of horses were killed. And that image reminded people that the Ulster question, the question of a united Ireland, was not going to be uh, magicked away in the negotiations to come. Back in Belfast, the level of casualties inflicted on Catholic civilians was so high, nationalists called it a pogrom, a term associated with the massacre of Jews in Eastern Europe. Whether one uses pogrom or not, certainly it describes a period of intense violence aimed at a particular community identifiable because, due to its religious affiliation. Perhaps the most notorious incident during the violence which accompanied Northern Ireland's birth was the attack on the McMahon family in North Belfast. It happened in the early hours of the 24th of March, 1922. Owen McMahon was a wealthy Catholic publican, probably the wealthiest Catholic businessman in Belfast. He had a string of public houses. He was not involved in politics, more interested in sport. A director of Glen Torren Football Club, for example, in East Belfast. You have one minute to say your prayers. Pray for your salvation in Jesus' name. 20 years ago, the BBC drama Rebel Heart included this scene, which drew heavily on the McMahon murders. <laughs> The room was described afterwards as resembling a badly conducted abattoir. This was singling out an entire family. And the shock we have said that it caused, not only locally, but throughout the world, was just tremendous. And European newspapers covered the story for some time afterwards. The murders were widely blamed on a gang of Royal Irish Constabulary police officers, acting supposedly in retaliation for the shooting of two Ulster Special Constables the previous day. In terms of a new state, as Northern Ireland was, trying to make it clear on the international front that Catholics would be safe there, the killing of the McMahons did nothing to help the reputation of the newly established Northern Ireland. Many historians blame the six murders on this man, District Inspector John Nixon. While John Nixon, the renegade police inspector, might not personally have been there on the day, it is highly likely that he ordered it, and it wasn't the only one of the attacks on Catholics that uh, his fingerprints are pretty clearly found all over. Eventually drummed out of the police, Nixon went on to carve out a career in politics as an independent Unionist MP at Stormont. He always denied involvement in the killings of the McMahons and many other arbitrary attacks on Catholic civilians. We know that in later years, in the mid-20s and in the 1930s, he successfully sued a publishing company and the Derry Journal, who would identify him as the leader of the murder gang. But I think certainly the evidence is strong against him. Another man who went on to a prominent role in politics was Frank Aitken. He rose to become Irish Tornister and External Affairs Minister. 
But in the 1920s, he was the commander of the Dundalk IRA and the mastermind behind the ambush on King George V's cavalry on the South Armagh border. Aitken's IRA division also instilled fear amongst many isolated Protestant families living in the area. The border IRA divisions, particularly Frank Aiken and South Armagh, are becoming very active. Now, of course, reprisals had been the name of the game in that border area uh, in 1922, and he decided on a policy of harsh reprisals. In 1907, the Gray family posed for a rare photograph together in the hamlet of Altnave near Newry. Nevin and his brother Joe are at the front. Fifteen years after this picture was taken, they were asleep in their beds when the IRA arrived. Nevin's son, Jack, has never talked in public before about what happened next. My aunts, they opened the window and says, what do you want? And they said, get out right away. We're burning the house down. So they grabbed everything and went outside. And it didn't stop there? No. They opened fire and... Uh, my grandfather, he got a bullet in the leg, and my uncle Joe, he was shot. He, uh, but he was very badly injured. He died in hospital that evening. Your uncle was a very young man at the time. How was your father? 20, and my father was 18. The gang wasn't finished. A short distance away, Thomas Crozier and his wife Elizabeth were also attacked. Thomas recognised the man at the front door that night and asked, what's going on here, Mick? And as that, he was shot twice. Thomas Crozier was Valerie Lockhart's great-grandfather. This artist's impression, shortly after his murder, was published in a newspaper at the time. Hearing the commotion, my great-grandmother, Elizabeth, came on the scene, and her words were, I didn't expect that of you, Willie for she recognised the voice of another man that night. And they shot her twice. She bled to death. So your great-grandmother and indeed your great-grandfather more or less sealed their death warrant by revealing that they knew who their attackers were? That's correct, yeah. My great-grandfather had actually helped the man that shot him out on his farm on the afternoon before the atrocity. For families like Valerie Lockhart's, the cycle of violence has reverberated down through the generations. I met her to talk about the events of 99 years ago. But as we chatted, she revealed a personal link to one of the most appalling incidents of the Troubles in the 1970s. The 10 men who were gunned down as they stood beside their minivan all died from multiple wounds. King's Mills. This was, quite simply, the worst sectarian attack of its sort in six and a half years of violence in Northern Ireland. The massacre of ten Protestant workmen after their minibus was stopped in South Armagh. Detectives find more than 100 spent cartridges at the scene. A cousin of my father's was the youngest fella, Robert Chambers, to be murdered in the King's Mills massacre. So on both sides of my family, we've had some sense of the atrocities that went on. Alan Black was the sole survivor of the massacre. Robert Chambers was Alan's apprentice. Shot 18 times, Alan was right next to Robert during his final moments. <sighs> my 18-year-old apprentice screaming for his mummy, and a gunman coming over and blowing his face away. And he was shouting, mummy, mummy, mummy. That comes back. That comes back often. The gunman that shot Robert Chambers. How can he live with that? I, have, I, I can barely live with it. And I was only there to witness it. How can he live with that? I could never understand that. The burned homes of the six people murdered at Outnavay were never rebuilt, 
but their orange hall still stands a few hundred yards from where the massacre took place. I met local orangeman and former Stormont Minister Danny Kennedy at the hall, which has been repeatedly vandalised in recent years. This is a closely knit, small, isolated, scattered unionist population. They, in large part, have held their ground. They've um, buried their dead. But our father's sepulchres are here. So we're not running away from anything. I think it illustrates the level of community, if you like, in that some of the families affected in 1922 are still families that have connections who had loved ones murdered um, during the more recent troubles. Someone with a distinctive understanding of the cost of the conflict here during the past century is Peter Heathwood. He's the curator of an extraordinary archive, a comprehensive library of the TV coverage of the Troubles. It all began in 1981, when he got his hands on a revolutionary new device, a VHS video cassette recorder. That was just an amazing piece of technology. When I bought it, believe it or not, it was the day of Bobby Sands' funeral. And I just, for some reason, recorded the next nights, the next nights, and just kept recording it. More than 14,000 days later, he's still recording the news. If people say to me, what's the most distressing thing in the whole archive? And I would say to them, it's the funerals. I says, you see, I don't care if that was an IRA man, a UVF man, a policeman or a soldier, but you see those families, they're, they're wrecked. That's destroyed them. This is the reality of Belfast today. From time to time, you forget that it's become part of everyday life. In the 1970s, Peter qualified as a history teacher, but then branched out into a successful career in insurance. On the 27th of September, 1979, he was at home on the Cliftonville Road with his wife Anne, their two toddlers, and their three-month-old baby Louise. There was a knock on the door. Anne opened it. This gunman came in all balaclavaed up, a gun in his right hand. He had Anne with her. She was squealing and shouting and kicking, and he pulled her into the room. I hit him with the door, knocked him into the hall, and threw my body weight against the door and put the bar in the door. Unknown to me, there was a second gunman in the hall, and he got lucky. He opened fire, hit the shoulder down through the ribs, hit the spine, and the other one went through the front of me, and a third bullet missed the baby by inches. That was Louise. So basically, I passed out pretty quickly. Peter's father arrived at the scene as he was being moved by the ambulance crew. Daddy seen me in the ambulance and just dropped dead of a heart attack on the spot. I think it was six, seven weeks before anybody was able to tell me Daddy had died. The shooting was a case of mistaken identity. The gunman's intended target was an IRA suspect living in the flat above. Straight up me first. <laughs> I met Peter two years ago at Westminster, where he was campaigning for a pension for those severely injured during the Troubles. When we talked about Northern Ireland's 100 years more recently, Peter told me the story of his dad's cousin, Thomas Heathwood, who lived on these streets in the Carrick Hill area of Belfast in the early 20th century. In 1911, Thomas was a seven-year-old school pupil. According to the census taken that year, he could read and write. By 1922, the teenage Thomas had a job which took him out onto the streets of Carrick Hill. Young Thomas, he was 17 years old. And on March the 6th, 1922, he was working in a butcher shop as an apprentice. 
and he was out on the bike. In them days, they would have delivered stuff on the bike. But as Thomas reached this street corner at tea time that Monday evening, shots rang out. There was a gun battle started between the army and loyalist gunmen who were in the Shankill overlooking it. And he was shot and wounded by a sniper and died of his injuries. He was a young lad just doing his day's work and got caught up in the middle of violence and the troubles. But researching the death of Thomas Heathwood, I examined documents which showed his father had written to the Irish government in an unsuccessful attempt to get a pension. And in an unexpected twist, it became clear Thomas wasn't just a butcher's apprentice. I wish to make application under your pension scheme in respect of the death of my son, Thomas Heathwood, who was killed by gunshot wounds by Crown forces while in action in Belfast on the 6th of March 1922, being a member of Nafiana Erin. Thank you in anticipation. Wow. So, what do you make of that? We I, no idea. My generation has no idea. The letter revealed something Peter hadn't known. Thomas hadn't just been delivering food, he'd also been carrying dispatches on his bicycle as a member of the youth wing of the 1920s IRA. Let's face it, a lot of young lads on both the Loyalist and the Republican side joined these organisations because they felt fear, they felt under attack, and they wanted to defend their area. A century on, in a different era and a different context, a new generation of teenagers have been out on the streets. The Peace Line riots were the worst disorder Belfast has seen in years. Most people must hope that the recent rioting isn't a harbinger of anything worse, and that the dark days of the 1920s and the 1970s have been consigned to our history. But nearly a quarter of a century after the Good Friday Agreement, can we be sure? My childhood, perhaps even uh, your childhood, uh, was very much dominated by uh, that conflict, that struggle, and those bitter memories. But I think this is a time, obviously, to think about it, but then for us all to, to move on and look at the, the future. We have to acknowledge the hurt uh, and the terrible deeds that were done, but out of that, uh, you know, people did evolve from it, and we can't be captured forever by the bitterness of the past. We've got to, we've got to let it go, um, and, and, and for the sake of future generations. So will future generations be freed from the bitterness of the past? We commissioned a survey on both sides of the border. It was carried out over the Easter period when clashes in a number of areas of Northern Ireland were taking place. We asked people if they're concerned there's a potential for violence here in the future. In Northern Ireland, 76% agree violence could return. Only 11% think it can't come back. In the South, an even bigger majority, 87%, told us they agree Northern Ireland might not have left its violent past behind. Back in the 1980s, I reported for Spotlight on contested anniversaries. Are the commemorations and reenactments really about the past, or are they simply vehicles for expressing passionately held views about what's happening here and now? Young people are the future generation, and they should know what's happened in the past. I would say that a lot of the older generation have sort of a, a distorted view. So the fact there's no consensus about this year's centenary doesn't come as a surprise to me. In 1971, when Northern Ireland turned 50, there was a vigorous debate about that anniversary. Well, it's arrived, Ulster 71. It exists notwithstanding argument and acrimony. 
The old Stormont government didn't have any reservations about marking the occasion. Instead, it organised an exhibition in Belfast's Botanic Gardens, with the entertainment provided by an up-and-coming young singer. You're asking me, well, I love you. I don't know, I don't know. When the offer came to be part of this huge Expo 71. It was very thrilling. It was um, a big gig for me, really. It was a, a real chance to show Ulster off, as it were. The huge pavilion that it was held in was a little bit daunting, full of very important people. I think we were just looking at a chance to celebrate something that was joyous rather than the gloom and doom and everything that was building up. I was about 13 at the time. I lived just round from the exhibition and I'd go every night, seeing the cutouts of the Ulster Generals, then take part mostly in the fun fair. I found it hugely exciting, I have to say, at the time. In view of the recent troubles, someone had irreverently christened the exhibition Explo 71, but there was no ill feeling or tension here today. Remember the jingle on TV, which was Ulster 71, come and join in the fun, and it was so ironic when you had blood in the streets and internment as this state was celebrating its 50th anniversary. The UK government wants this year's centenary to be a celebration of sports stars and other remarkable people from Northern Ireland. Wayne McCulloch is a child of the 70s who did his fighting in the ring, not in the streets. A Protestant from the Shankill Road, Wayne had to box clever around the challenges posed by identity politics. In 1988, he made history, representing Ireland at the Olympics in Seoul. I was the youngest member of the Irish team, and they asked me would I carry the flag, and they said go and think about it, but I just thought there's nothing to think about here because I'm representing the country. And I said yes, and the tension back home was pretty, pretty bad. In 1990, he held the Northern Ireland flag aloft after winning gold at the Commonwealth Games in Auckland. There couldn't be any doubt about it. Nobody ever said anything about that flag. No, because it's a Northern Ireland flag and represent Northern Ireland, and you know, Ireland don't go to the Commonwealth Games. So I was proud of carrying the Irish flag and I was proud of carrying the, the Northern Ireland flag. Wayne's sporting achievements brought all sides together but he was born just yards away from the Belfast Peace Wall, which keeps Protestants and Catholics apart. I grew up in the Shankill Road area. I seen a lot of kilns, a lot of seen a lot of bombs going off. It was it was terrible. You know, some of my friends I grew up with went and signed up. You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about? They signed up for the paramilitaries. Some people get out, some people can't get out. Now living in Las Vegas. He thinks Northern Ireland's sporting achievements shouldn't be forgotten when people mark this year's 100th anniversary. Boxing always brought people together. You know, we've had like a, a good few world champions over the years. It always crossed divides, and I think it, it should be a big part of, of 100 years of Northern Ireland. And one day, Wayne would like to see the peace wall that overshadowed his own childhood home brought down. As I always say to people, if there's real peace, they, they take down the wall. Can you ever see that day coming? Well, I'll, I'll take the first brick out. I'd, love, I'd, I'd, I'd definitely take the first brick out. Nobody's expecting the peace line to come down in this centenary year but Peter Heathwood wants a very different kind of wall built, one to commemorate the human cost of the past 100 years. One of the things I would like to have seen done is a wall at Stormont with all the names of the people who have died since this state was founded in political sectarian violence. Far from considering building a memorial wall, the Stormont parties are currently at loggerheads over a unionist proposal for a commemorative stone. 
the three unionist leaders uh, were wanting to mark the centenary with a very inoffensive uh, centenary stone. It was just simply um, a replica of the map of Northern Ireland in, in, in granite. Um, and we were paying for it. And because Sinn Féin said no uh, and everything works by consensus, it meant that we weren't able to do that. Whenever the issue of a stone was presented, it would be much better if it had been presented in such a way as to have, let's have an inclusive conversation about how all of our identities can live side by side and be reflected in the parliament that people actually return us to. With Stormont politicians in disagreement over the centenary, it's fallen to the UK government to take the lead. So does the Prime Minister think this 100th birthday is a reason to celebrate? Myself, as a proud unionist, I, I think it's a, a, a moment indeed to celebrate a wonderful part of the United Kingdom, uh, everything that it, uh, it does, and also uh, the incredible potential of Northern Ireland, and that's uh, really where I think we should be. We should be looking. But what attitude do you take to this year's anniversary? We asked people if they agree the formation of Northern Ireland is an achievement which should be celebrated. Here, 40% agree, but 45% say no, it shouldn't be celebrated. In fact, the greatest levels of support here are for approaching the centenary in a neutral way and recognising our sporting and cultural achievements. In the South, 50% of the people we surveyed don't regard the centenary as a cause for celebration. For some, the creation of Northern Ireland was as much about hard economics as it was about politics. In the early 1900s, there was no doubt where the economic powerhouse of Ireland was. Belfast had heavy engineering and the linen industry. The Harland and Wolf shipyard had produced the world's most famous ocean liner. Its chief designer was Thomas Andrews, who famously went down with the ship. He was part of a family which personified Ulster's business and professional elite. Here he is with the family cricket team in a photograph taken in 1895. It includes James, who became Lord Chief Justice of Northern Ireland, and John Miller Andrews, who became a Unionist MP in the first Northern Parliament. It was incredible, these three brothers, uh, who reached the top of the tree in, in each of their spheres, politics, the law, and industry through the shipbuilding connection. The Andrews family were firm backers of the creation of the new Northern Ireland state in 1921. Well, I think in the, in the first instance, it was to maintain the business connections with England and to maintain the free trade. It was so important for industry to have this open trade, open in the world, and there was always the fear that um, an Irish free state would become protectionist. Northern Ireland's first prime minister, James Craig, had established an uneasy stability by the mid-1920s, but his government stood accused of discriminating against the Catholic minority. The state has set up was a cold place for nationalists, and all of that, of course, is uh, uh, made worse by the sectarian speeches of the 1930s, uh, coming mainly from unionist sources. Uh, Sir Basil Brooke, the future Lord Brooke, was saying, you know, he wouldn't employ, employ Catholics the right to cut your throats. However, some unionists point out that, in its early days, nationalists chose to boycott the institutions of the new state. Employment, the problem there is in specific areas. I don't think it's a, it's a problem right across Northern Ireland. Nationalist commentators just point to a few examples and they are all, always the same examples. Uh, can I just go back and suggest that in the early days of the storm in Parliament, um, nationalists were very, very unwilling to play ball. John Miller Andrews served as a minister at Stormont, eventually becoming Northern Ireland's Prime Minister in 1940. Ulster should remain part of the United Kingdom and with the rest of the Empire 
unswerving in its loyalty. His great-grandson believes that rather than discriminating against Catholics, J.M. Andrews did everyone in Northern Ireland a favour. That was by insisting they should get the same social and economic benefits as their counterparts in England. Our position was very precarious. You know, we weren't a, a, a full partner within the union, and there's no doubt that um, great-grandfather's great achievement was achieving that parity which delivered the welfare state provisions and the National Health Service. Maintaining parity with Great Britain is something unionists remain concerned about. In 2021, they fear their economic parity could be eroded by Northern Ireland's new trading arrangements. Welcome, everyone, to Easter Monday. We should have been out parading, but the sooner we can get back out, the better. Glad to see, oh, almost 200 of you joining us. Thank you so much. We put it to the vote, and you said you want to see all Easter Mondays gone past. During the pandemic, orange woman Valerie Quinn has become a Facebook presenter, providing marchers and band members with a taste of what they've been missing in the lockdown. This is 2002, York Street, Apprentice Boys. But when not live streaming on Facebook, Valerie is increasingly concerned about the intentions of the Westminster government. The Ulster Protestant generally likes the status quo. They're not agitators for change. I don't know what it is with the unionist people, but we have blind faith in the UK government. The entire 100 years of, of, of Northern Ireland and we have been let down so many times. The reason for Valerie's concern, the new economic border in the Irish Sea. Unionists point to Boris Johnson's speech to the DUP annual conference in 2018. Good afternoon, good afternoon, my fellow, my fellow unionists. They viewed it as a guarantee he would not, in his words, allow Northern Ireland to become an economic semi-colony of the European Union. I have to tell you, no British Conservative government could or should sign up to any such arrangement. We just wanted things left the way that they were, and that was kind of what Boris promised. It's not what ended up, so you can understand why we feel let down. Betrayal is maybe how some people would feel. People will remember 1921 as the year when a land frontier was created in Ireland. Yes. They might remember 2021 as the year when you signed off on an Irish sea border separating Great Britain and Northern Ireland economically. Well, Mark, I really hope they won't look at it that way because uh, I think, actually, that if we get this right and we uh, manage the whole protocol back into the right place, I think that uh, Northern Ireland can be in a fantastic a position. What would you say to those unions who've accused you of betrayal over this? Because they remember you going to the DUP conference and saying no sea border, and then there has been a sea border, albeit that you've delayed some of the um, harsher yeah. aspects of it. Well, uh, what we're doing is removing uh, the what I think of as the uh, you know, unnecessary uh, uh, in protuberances and uh, and barriers that have that have that have grown up and uh, uh, the we're getting the getting the barnacles off the thing and I, there have been uh, and sandpapering it uh, into into shape. Do you trust Boris Johnson? Sadly, no. No, he clearly said several occasions, and his ministers have said there'd be no uh, border down the Irish Sea, and it's there plainly there for everybody to see. Believe me, we have time to get this right. We have an absolute duty to get this right. The whole thing reorientates us economically towards the South, which itself then would lead towards a united Ireland. So one of the reasons is we're looking to the future here and we want to remain a part of the United Kingdom. The protocol doesn't allow that for that economically. The Taoiseach defends the trade protocol and he rejects unionist assertions that the Irish sea checks pose a danger to the UK's integrity. The protocol is, is not tearing the United Kingdom apart. That's just an overly dramatic presentation of it in, in, in our view. And it explicitly affirms the constitutional position of Northern Ireland and the principle of consent. 
So it's not a danger to the constitutional position of Northern Ireland at all, and was never intended to be. As things stand, you haven't yet convinced Boris Johnson that he should scrap this protocol altogether. It's a work in progress, Mark. And look, can I just say, this is not the first time that unionism has been challenged by uh, things that have happened to it by uh, our own government. When you look back at the Anglo-Irish Agreement of 1985, uh, when I was 15, uh, and that was very much uh, one of those events that sticks in your mind as a teenager as to what is our government doing uh, with us here in Northern Ireland. And we worked through that and we will work through this because we have to do that to make sure that Northern Ireland is an, as integral a part of the United Kingdom. So what should happen to the economic sea border? We asked people, should the Northern Ireland Protocol be scrapped? Here, 48% agree, 46% disagree. In the South, a large majority, 74%, said the Protocol should not be scrapped. In the 1990s, an emerging bunch of comedians, the Hole in the Wall gang, had an idea about how to start their act. What's this? This shall never do. We'll pretend to be an orange band and we'll march through the actual audience and say this is our traditional route to the stage. You are sitting in our traditional route to the stage. <laughs> So we'll inconvenience everybody, get a row up out of their seats, and then we'll march to the stage. Right, lad, to the stage! Oh, it was a, a very good way of just satirising that entire situation in, you know, 30 seconds. And it got a huge reaction from people because that was the argument of the Orange Order. We need to march through these areas because it's traditional, it's traditional. We just said, well, traditional is just a ridiculous thing. That's a, that's a, that's a stupid argument. Likely. I think what we're looking at here really is a policing solution on the Ormer Road. The traditional route to the stage sketch satirised the reports myself and other journalists were filing, covering tense standoffs over orange marches. It's an inauspicious start to Northern Ireland's marching season. Mark Devonport, BBC News, on the Ormer Bridge in Belfast. Ever since the creation of Northern Ireland, a crude numbers game balancing Protestants versus Catholics has often played a major role in determining the course of events. One of the underlying reasons why the traditional roots of the Orange Marchers were challenged in the 1990s was population change on the ground. As district master of the Ballinafai Orange Lodge in South Belfast, Noel Liggett was often at the centre of confrontations. There was some very hot occasions. I remember having to go to negotiate with the police, and I have never seen a petrol bomb coming towards me, but you see we flicker of light and suddenly the ground erupts in flames around you. It's quite a disturbing situation, so it is. In South Belfast, the working-class Protestant community was dwindling and the number of Catholic residents growing. That meant some parades were neither as welcome nor as tolerated as they might have been in the past. When the Protestant middle classes began moving out of South Belfast, those Protestant communities left behind were largely the ones in public housing, and they felt a sense of threat. They felt a loss of security. They felt um, that they'd been deserted, and so, not surprisingly, they wanted a show of loyalty, which they got on those big occasions like the 12th of July. But underneath that, the population had changed considerably. There was Catholics that lived in Yorm Road, and it was mixed, so it was. Um, but it would have been overwhelmingly Unionist in nature. And then those figures have changed, really. Over what kind of time period, would you say? I would say from the start of the Troubles, um, slowly below the bridge changed. Recognising the changing realities, the Ballinafai Orange Order reached out to its neighbours. 
Three years ago, the lodge hosted the Breeder GAA Club in its hall. Just hope you all enjoy it and you're very, very welcome. That's something it would have been hard to imagine 25 years ago. I think it was informative for the Emmons, it was informative for us. Um, so it was, and to be, it was always been just about being good neighbours. I don't believe that tradition gives you a right to walk here or there wherever you want. What I do believe is that if people are part of a community, then they have to have equal rights with every other section of that community, so they do. From its creation, the religious balance of the population was crucial to the existence of Northern Ireland. After analysing the 1911 census, Unionists settled on a six-county state because it gave Protestants a secure two-to-one majority. They decided that four counties was too small and nine counties was too big because there were too many Catholics in it, you know, and I think this is the, from the nationalist perspective, it's always, you know, this is basically a sectarian head count and a squiggly line was drawn around an area that Unionists thought they could control for, you know, up to 100 years, who knew? For 50 years, the two-to-one Protestant majority remained unchanged, but from 1970 onwards, the numerical gap began to close. We see increase with the Catholic birth rate running almost double that of the, the Protestant population, but it was also immigration um, tailing off that Catholics were no longer going to England. The census is almost here. Ten years ago, the census reported there were more Protestants than Catholics living here, but not an overall majority. This year's census will measure how the population is continuing to shift. My expectation is that we'll end up with two population groups of approximately the same size, neither a majority, bobbing around somewhere about 46 48%. Clearly, just because someone's a Protestant doesn't mean they're a Unionist. And just because someone's a Catholic doesn't mean they're a Nationalist. That said, next year's census results on religion and national identity will be closely examined by politicians and academics, keen to work out what clues they might provide regarding Northern Ireland's future. My guess is that the Catholic population will be slightly larger than the Protestant population, but the crucial thing is that neither one will be a majority. But we may end up, you know, in the centenary of the state 100 years on, in the ironic position where a state that was created um, in order to ensure a permanent uh, majority of Protestants may end up with Protestants in a minority. <laughs> I can finally say she is my wife. Northern Ireland is a changing society. People who don't see themselves as traditional unionists or nationalists could prove vital in determining our future. I think increasingly the people are in a different place than the politics. And if you look at the decline in, in voting for both unionist and nationalist parties and the growth in, in voting for, for non-designated parties, I think that um, you know, bears witness to the fact that, 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 that people are actually moving to a different place from where our politics is, is currently at. In September 1912, a milestone on the road to the creation of the new Northern State. Thousands of Unionists converge on Belfast City Hall following Edward Carson's lead by signing the Ulster Covenant, a pledge to use all means necessary to oppose Irish Home Rule. Amongst them, Claire Mitchell's family, unquestionably Unionist, but apparently at ease with Gaelic culture. Rummaging through an old suitcase, Claire found an Irish music book her great-great-grandfather used to keep his covenant pledge free from creases. When I opened this book for the first time at home, there was an Ulster's Solemn League and Covenant inside, and it was signed by William McBride, who is my great-great-grandfather. And I loved that they were just sitting there kind of seamlessly um, entangled as two seemingly contradictory artefacts. 
Claire found memorabilia which revealed her Protestant ancestors had close friendships with their Catholic neighbours. And I also find this photo of my grandmother. Um, she was a Protestant and also a champion festival Irish dancer. Valerie Quinn's family also signed the Ulster Covenant. I think there's something like 16 of my paternal grandfather's side who all signed it in, in that time, and there was, I think, 433 from this local area, so it was, it was a very hot topic. It was a scary time, and I can understand their fear. I can understand why they wanted to remain part of the UK, um, because that's something that I would wish for now as well. But um, yeah, it was a really, really unsettled time for them. So both women's ancestors were ardent supporters of the creation of Northern Ireland 100 years ago. But amidst increasing speculation about the possibility of a border poll, they have very different views on the future. I hope that the era of headcount politics is coming to an end. We're just going to have to think about things very differently. I would personally vote for unity, I think, at the moment. But that's not really out of a sense of nationalism. That's driven by my values, what's going to be important, the environment. Easter Monday is meant to be a bank holiday. It's meant to be off. By contrast, Valerie Quinn finds the prospect of a united Ireland terrifying. Everything that I've been brought up in, everything my family is rooted in, there really just isn't anything emotionally for me, or indeed even economically, through society. It, it just feels like an alien concept to me. I just, I just, it, it scares me. It, it, the idea of it actually scares me. Most Unionists dismiss Sinn Féin's invitation to start planning for a new Ireland. But political observers warn that one of the lessons of the Brexit referendum is that it might be wise for all sides to look before they leap. I think that politicians north and south and politicians in Westminster should be thinking quite carefully about the possibility of a border poll because whether or not you're in favour of Irish unification or a border poll happening, I think people could agree that a worst case scenario is that a border poll takes place with no preparation, with little understanding of the stakes involved, where voters can't be informed and governments aren't ready. The Taoiseach rejects Sinn Féin calls for a border poll within the next five years. Brexit is proving to be difficult and challenging in terms of the North-South relationship and in terms of the East-West relationship. So I, I feel throwing a border poll in on top of that would have been very explosive and divisive. I think sometimes the Taoiseach is a wee bit behind the, the wider population. Increasingly, more and more people are entering into the conversation around Irish unity, what that might look like. Not just nationalists and republicans, I might add, also those of a British identity are also involved in the conversation. According to the Good Friday Agreement, however, it's the British government which decides when, if ever, the time is right to put the matter to a vote. Are you ruling out a border poll on your watch? I don't think the Secretary of State is, is going to be in that position uh, for, a, you know, not as far as I can see, and uh, for, for a very, very long time to come. And uh, I would rather uh, that we all thought uh, collectively, not about, uh, you know, what we can do to split ourselves uh, apart from each other, but what we can do uh, to, together. The former First Minister, Peter Robinson, has advocated preparing for a border poll as a unionist insurance policy. But the current DUP leader doesn't want to go there. We shouldn't be even talking about a border poll. We should be talking about why it's important to be within the United Kingdom, why it's the right thing for all of our people. Why in heaven's name would people give that up to go in with a small state of a huge European Union when you could be part of an integrated United Kingdom, which is a global player? 
We asked people how they would vote if a border poll was held today to decide if Northern Ireland should stay in the UK. Here, 49% say they'd vote for Northern Ireland to remain in the UK. 43% say they'd vote to leave the UK and join a united Ireland. In the Republic, 51% say they would vote for Northern Ireland to join them in a united Ireland today. So our survey suggests if a border poll was held today, it wouldn't lead to a change. But how much longer will Northern Ireland last? They tended to say about the Government of Ireland Act that it would last for a generation in setting up Northern Ireland. In fact, it's lasted for five. The future is in the hands of the people. At least we know that from the Good Friday Agreement. This is a decade for us all to plan, devise something that's better for us all, because the society in which we all live in now, I don't believe, serves everybody in a fair way, and in a good enough way. But will things change in a decade from now? We asked people how much longer they think Northern Ireland will remain in the UK. Here, a majority, 55%, believe it will still be part of the UK in 10 years' time. In the South, a majority, 59%, also think its status won't have changed by then. But what about the longer term? Another British Prime Minister famously said, I feel the hand of history on my shoulder. Well, I think it's time to talk about the future. I feel the hand of science on my shoulder. I feel the hand of medicine on my, on, on my shoulder. I feel the, sign of, uh, the hand of, let me think, uh, bioscience, how about that, uh, on my shoulder. I imagine in another hundred years' time, you would imagine there'll be a completely different dispensation on this side. Absolutely, of course, of course there would be, yeah. Realistically, how much longer do you think Northern Ireland will remain a part of the UK? Oh, I'll be long gone, uh, Mark, I'll be long gone. Uh, so uh, Northern Ireland will remain part of the UK because, as I've said, it's a rational, political idea. We also asked people to look forward 25 years. Here, a majority, 51%, think Northern Ireland will have left the UK by then. In the South, a majority, 54%, also believes Northern Ireland will leave the UK within 25 years. Northern Ireland's journey through time has been full of drama. Too often, tragic and terrifying but at times momentous and uplifting. Reflecting on the events of the last century has been sobering, but whatever the future brings, perhaps it can help us all to avoid repeating our past mistakes. On the BBC News and I website and on the BBC iPlayer now, Jim Fitzpatrick will be exploring the issues and delving further into the results of that cross-border poll with Mark Davenport and guests. DeLorean was the...